To begin with, first of all, I want to thank you for all the things that you do for our students in whatever capacity you do it in. Because really without you, our students wouldn't be where they are today and where they're going in the future. So today I'm going to talk about personalized learning and the five big ideas that I have learned as a result of a great deal of work that I've had with educators both in district and out of district. My name is Scott Kinkoff. I'm a tech integrator for grade 612. Um, I'm an instructional coach I'm, and I work closely with teachers to really come to the point where they can begin to design instruction that's both personal and effective and engaging for our students. Um, I'm a Google trainer, have been so for the past couple of years. And if you want to reach me, if you want to connect with me on Twitter, you can see my Twitter handle there. And then as a result of today's talk, if anybody is interested at all to go down this path of making learning more personal for their students and what does that look like in your classrooms or even in your schools, please contact me at my email address and I'd be happy to engage you in conversations and help you get uh, on that path. So we're sitting in a tech conference and obviously the focus is computers and technology. Our students have access to a myriad of technology 24-7. Anything from tablets to smartwatches to um, Chromebooks to computers to laptops, they have access to it. And in result of this, there's lots of systems that have come up from the ed tech world that have said we can personalize learning for students by putting them in front of a computer. So I read a blog post from Modern Learners who happens to be run by um, Will Richardson and Bruce Dixon. And in that blog post, they asked the question, can technology really personalize learning for our students? And in complete openness, that in our school district, we use one of those systems called iReady. And what iReady does is they give, a, they give a base test, they figure out where students are, and then they start to, the, the system starts to deliver instruction based on gaps that are missing in student learning. But the real question is, is, is personalized learning personalized by a computer? And often I get teachers who say to me, hey, Scott, what is out there that I can use in my classroom to enrich or intervene for students? And ultimately, my response is none. There is none. And the reason why I say that isn't because it doesn't exist, but because I believe you, sitting in the audience, and myself as an educator, are the people who can really personalize learning for our students. That's a lot of hard work, and it's a lot of rewarding work, but it's the work that a computer cannot do. So, in my work with teachers over the past few years, what have I come to understand? The first big idea is to know your students. Now, this isn't anything new, but when you take a look at the picture behind me, you can see that there's two parts to it. The first part is the data piece. With, again, with so much technology available to us, we can collect reams of data. We can use that data, we can help it to drive our decision making in classrooms and in schools and in lessons using formative and summative data to help us figure out exactly where the gaps are missing. And we need this data. It's simply a part of what we do right now and our, the technology that we have at our fingertips helps us to analyze and understand our students from a data-centric point of view. So it's needed. But more importantly than just the data is knowing your students. And I believe that everyone in this room, myself included, at some point at the beginning of the school year, gives students some sort of interest survey. Whether it's online or it's on paper, it doesn't matter. We start to collect this information about our students. And why do we do this? We do it so that when we go to sit down and talk next to a student, when we start to think about the, their instructional needs, this personalized information that we've gathered from our students helps drive our instruction. And when we take a look then at the image on the upper side of that picture, we begin to understand the quirks and the uniqueness and the, the things that drive our students. Not because the data tells us, but because we've sat down next to them and we understand our students. Part of this though, um, in when we start to personalize learning, we make it more personal for students, is, is the concept of pre-assessment data. And what's important there is, and what I say to teachers when I work with them, 
I say to them, you know, you don't know until you ask. In an age where learning is ubiquitous, that our students can turn on their cell phones and their smartphones, they can pull out their tablets, they can start to learn whatever they want, when they want, based on their own interests, not because we tell them to, but based on their own interests. Then we have to start to begin to wonder, well, what do they already know? Because our students can dig into anything that they want based on their needs and interests. So the first big idea about personalized learning isn't anything brand new or rocket science, it's simply know your students. But from knowing your students, then you can give them what they need. So pretend you're going to plan a party. You pick the party, whether it's a birthday, whether it's a BCS championship party, it's a Super Bowl party, or whatever it is. And you think about the people coming to your party and you say, well, the easiest thing for me to do when I go to plan for the party is just to order pizza, get chips and pop and plates and do all the simple things that make it really expedient to make the party go. You've really given no thought to the people coming. You just made it very easy for yourself to go ahead and plan the party and make it go. But what if we switch the narrative? What if we switch it to, hey, I know that in my, the people coming to my party, I have some people who are lactose intolerant, that are gluten free. I know that some have diabetes and can't handle sugar. And we start to really dial in on the hard work of knowing the people who are coming to us and coming to the party. So that, such that when they arrive, there's something there for them and they're like, wow, they really thought of me personally when creating and crafting this menu and, and, uh, for the party. And now if we turn that, that example over into education speak, we have to start to think of our kids about what they really need as a result of data and knowing them as people. Because we can no longer say that a one-size-fits-all lesson plan or unit fits for every student. And I believe this to be true. In fact, I, I don't have to believe it, I know it. Talking with many educators in many different contexts, we all believe students learn differently. And we all believe that they have different needs. But the most expedient thing to do for us is to simply design a single lesson hoping that it reaches everybody when it only reaches maybe one or two. So when it comes down to personalized learning, and one of the big things that I've learned is, is that to do this, uh, to, to personalize learning and to give students what they need is really the next big thing. Something else I've learned as a result of doing all of this based on data and students is that flexibility just isn't for yoga. Interesting to this, I had a conversation with, and this is gonna sound some, somewhat odd, but I had a conversation with a tire salesman this summer. And he works for Goodyear at their main office down in Akron. And he said something to the effect of, oh, you guys have summers off. We've all heard it, right? Right? Because we don't have summers off. We're usually doing something to develop ourselves. We're reading or we're studying or we're taking classes or what, or what have you. And I looked at him and I said, hey, how many clients do you have? And he said, six. I said, just six? He says, yeah. Now, I've got to imagine that they're high-profile clients. And I said to him, now I want you to imagine a teacher has anywhere from 30 to 150 clients who are in fact all different, who are in fact have all different needs, who have different social emotional learning needs, who come to us out of atmospheres and conditions that we may not even understand. And we plan for 130 to 150 different clients every single day and we are expected to do it in a way that gets them to be proficient by the end of grade level. If we think about ourselves in terms, in that, in that light, then you, we can't be rigid. If we continue to be rigid, then we can't personalize because then it's a teacher-centered approach to learning and instruction. It means that we are the people who are most important in the room and that's not anywhere in case the truth. We have to switch our thinking over to being flexible so that we're student-centered. So that when they come to us, it doesn't matter what their needs are, no matter what the work is going to be and how hard it gets, we switch over into this mindset that says, this client needs this, or this group of clients in my classroom needs this, because they are demonstrating these needs. So the next big thing that I learned is, is that flexibility isn't just for yoga, it really belongs in every single classroom. This next big idea really is nothing new as well. You chose to be here today. 
and you chose to be here today because you saw something valuable in your own PD. Over the many instances where I've designed PD and worked with teachers, when they come in for PD either with me in my school system or out in other school districts, what I've noticed is that teachers want control. Again, this is nothing new, but they want control over their professional development. And above all, myself and you hate your time wasted. There is no point coming into a PD session where you feel you get nothing out of it. So that's why you've chosen to be here today, because you want to get something out and take something away. But I also know that when it comes down to the PD and districts and you know the PD days come up and you see the list of things and they tell you where to go and you groan inwardly that says, oh my gosh, this is going to be a waste of my time. Students feel the exact same way. You know, if we think about it in terms of engagement and being effective, then our students walk into us with that same mindset, like, do I really have to learn this today? Do I really have to dig into this today? This doesn't really meet my needs. And when I bring this up, when I bring that notion up to educators, things take a little shift. Not a big shift, but a little shift that says, you know what, I'm going to try to do more to give them more voice and choice. So as educators, we want the voice, we want to say what our PD should be and how we engage in that. Students want the exact same thing. What are some things you can do? Give them some voice over how much practice they actually have to do for your classes. Give them a choice over the assessments that they turn in. Give them a choice over projects. Those are just some basic ideas and the examples can go on. But the fourth big idea is, is that they want to have a voice in your classroom and that also helps to personalize learning. The fifth big idea is, is that we can no longer wait. <clears throat> it's, it's pretty simple. Our students don't have to wait to go and learn, but we make them wait and learn in our classrooms when we're ready to move on. But some of them are ready to move much faster than we're comfortable with, and others of them need us to help pull them along. But until we're ready to shift our gears from a one-size-fits-all type atmosphere to, hey, let's dig in and let's figure out how we can help small groups of students move forward quickly and, and, and faster, then we begin to understand their needs and we can personalize learning. Now, <clears throat> at the end of all of this, I want to validate something. This is super hard work. And it's not easy and no one can personalize learning down to the individual student. So imagine if you have 30 students and you think that I'm advocating that you create 30 different learning plans for students, that's impossible. But what we can do is we can start with the future in mind that says, I'm going to personalize learning for small groups of students at different levels in my classroom who are ready for different things to be learning. And that begins the process. So, five big ideas. Know your students. From a data standpoint and who they are. Give them what they need. As a result of all the data and all of the interactions you have with them, you know what their needs are. Give it to them. Be flexible. Know where the pivot points are in your classroom and what students' needs are, and then you can begin to personalize learning for them. And then um, voice and choice, give them an opportunity to say what they want and how they want to go about it. And finally, the future is now. Thank you for coming. I know that the rest of the day is going to be awesome with the playground and with EdCamp. Thank you for listening.